COVID-19 tips sponsored by Dexo. One, practice social distancing. Two, wear your mask when leaving the house. Three, wash your hands regularly for 20 seconds using our Dexo. Four, cover your nose and mouth with a disposable tissue or flex elbow when you cough or sneeze. Choose Dexo for that extra cleanliness. Dex Soap is affordable and available nationwide. It is now 19 hours 30 on this Wednesday evening. Down from your window. Stay tuned. Coming up next is Room 592 with Dr. Yog Mahadio. Enough, my dear, with such a man free. Welcome to the land of many faces. Not one, not two, but six different races. You know when the sun gives your skin, you're in the right place. G U I A N N. Oh, that's my beautiful country. G U I A N N. One people, one nation, one destiny.
It is now 19 hours 40. We do apologize for the late start this evening of Room 592 with Dr. Yog Mahadio, his guest this evening, as we await her presence, Minister of Education, herself, Honorable Priya Manik Chand. But in the meantime, as we await, good evening, Dr. Yog Mahadio. How are you this evening? Good evening to you, Mr. Kevin Smith, and good evening to all of our viewers and listeners joining us wherever you're coming from. We are just about getting started, and Kevin, I need that link to uh, refresh to send it to the minister, if you don't mind, sir. Yes, no one problem, right away. I'll get, one second, I'll get it there. That, there you go. So uh, thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, our apologies for the late start. Some things are beyond our control, and we do know that uh, our good uh, technical operators, Kevin Smith, Joshua Van Sleitman, and Raj from the studio there have been working hard behind the scenes to make sure that everything is ready for our show tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind you, you are in tune to Kaito Radio and you are on the premier program, Room 592, where we unleash the truth. It is the time when we start to discuss, as we have this week, not just what has happened in the past, but what is happening presently, and to start to remind the government, of course, there is no honeymoon period, the honeymoon period is over in a couple of days, and we get on with the business of running this country. And our technical difficulties apart, we will be joined by Honorable Minister Priya Manikchan in a couple of moments. And ladies, uh, there she is, Minister, is with us. Good night to you, Minister. How are you tonight? Hi. Hi, Yo. How are you? Very well. Thank you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let me be let me remind you once again and welcome you once again to room 592 where we unleash the truth and our apologies for a little bit of our technical difficulties we have had some things are beyond our control sometimes and you know how it goes but we are here with our program and let me thank minister for joining us on all of your behalf we know it's been a torrid two to two and a half weeks of a new government they have had to get into it and hit the ground running minister how have you found the running after hitting the ground from August uh, August 3rd? <laughs> well, you know, if we're going to use the um, the language, I think it was a little fit. We, we had to get ourselves fit in that period because we knew that the people of Ghana had voted for us. And we had stayed pretty in touch with what was happening. I don't think you could say fully in touch because you're not in the ministry. But we had stayed relatively in touch with what was happening. And... This is the ministry that I was in before. So it was, it was I, don't, I don't want to say easy because we make things look easy, but um, it's been a full two weeks. Let me say that. But we couldn't waste any time, in my view, uh, about making a decision about what we will do for the September opening. I think the, the major thing for parents was they were concerned that they weren't getting the information. So we just needed to make a decision. The thing about making a decision, though, Yoga, is not... Um, it sounds like an easy thing, but you have to go through so many things before you get to the decision. Um, so that's what we were doing really in the last week. Great. So Minister, tell us a little bit. We mm -hmm. did hear your most recent statement that the September 7th opening is now impossible because of so many things that has to be done. And I think primary in yours and the stakeholders' consideration would be the safety of our children. Tell yeah. us a little about that decision and also when is it likely the schools may be reopened so um we're definitely not opening for september 7th and that's because we're just not physically ready so to open schools we would need to um make sure it's for face to face teaching that is it's uh we know what the disease pattern is the epidemiological patterns we know we can provide masks for our teachers and students, that the school is clean, that they have um, hand washing facilities, uh, that there is enough physical spacing and so on. Because we are not ready, so we, we definitely from the health perspective, because we got their help in making this decision too, we don't know as yet what's happening, Yoga. And that's unfortunately be, unfortunate because we weren't testing in Guyana in the numbers we should have been testing in. So we don't have the full picture. We, we don't know what the numbers really are. Now you're getting a sense of what the numbers are. But let me tell you, you saw four to today. 
that were positive today, and I say today in quotes because there's 700 tests backlog. The, the, the capacity of the country was, um, was and remains very small, and there was very little done to improve that capacity. We seem to be taking the position earlier on under the APNU, AFC, that, well, if we don't know, we wouldn't know, we're not testing. But with 700 backlog tests, you're almost likely to see large numbers every day, large numbers every day. Um, the problem with not testing people is you have asymptomatic people walking around, and I'm no doctor, but I understand they are also very infectious. Um, so, you know, the couple of people I know that are COVID positive, 50% of them, and, and I don't know that's a good representation, but I was checking it, were totally asymptomatic, did not know. They just got tested because they were contact people. Um, and some other people have fevers and skin pains and headaches and so on. So, so uh, definitely September 7th is out where reopening of schools are concerned. It is totally out because, like I said, outside of the disease pattern, which we still don't know, you actually have to have masks. We didn't procure any as a ministry, and it will not be ready for September 7th. We have to have enough hand washing facilities in our schools. We did not put up any, or in some case, in some schools, any at all. And where we put up a few to cater for the common entrance and CXE students, it's not enough for the whole school population. We don't have, in, in many of the places, the infrastructure is broken down. We don't have toilets that are working. We don't have, um, those things have to be in place before we, because even if the numbers start coming down, we have to still be safe uh, in, in terms of, how we practice our social distancing. And so we keep getting notes that this school has no ventilation. So that's something we have to fix. We can't go into a school, crowd people into it. And there's no ventilation. We're not ready for September, uh, face, face opening. But we're working really hard, yo, to try to deliver education differently through technology, TV or internet or radio, um, different means. And we're really uh, struggling right now working feverishly right now to try to get some of those up and running for the second week in September. Great. And so Minister, um, I know that it is too early to make that call, but is there any likelihood that it may open before the end of the year? Too early to make the call, like you said. We have a couple of considerations. One, I literally just opened the phone to, to get your message <clears throat> regarding their connection here and a parent wrote me to say um what are you going to do with the parents who have to go back to work right. who can no longer look after their children so those are some concerns because you have shops opening but us saying schools should close these are some of the softer issues we don't look at what are you going to do with these kids who are at home in the previous months everything was closed so everybody stayed home or should have um, we also know we are preparing for international exams. We are preparing for CXE. We are preparing for other C CAPE and so on. And they seem to be speeding ahead. So we can't keep our children's ch children away and uh, stop our children's preparation for the exam uh, because of COVID. While other countries in the Caribbean are plodding on, I meet with CXE virtually, of course, on Friday. And I intend, this is the, the sole reason I want to meet with them this early, because they invited me to meet later on, um, explore what we're going to do as a region. Trinidad just locked down their country and said very clearly that schools will remain closed until December 31st. And so we know for sure Trinidad is staying closed. And that's one a big, con a very big contributor in terms of number of students as well as financial to CXE. So I think, you know, they need to take Take, uh, pay some attention to some of us um, in the region and what's happening and treat us differently perhaps than they're treating the other um, regions that are recording zero active cases. Correct. So um, ladies and gentlemen, just to, uh, just to uh, focus a little bit on a very important point that was made just now by the minister too, that remember when there was a total lockdown and parents couldn't go to work and, and, and children couldn't go to school and everybody was home. But in this case, we have where parents are now resuming, some workplaces are reopening, but the children will be left at home. And so you have a little bit of disparity, a paradigm shift there once again. Minister, in terms of the, the teachers, uh, for public schools, do we presume that the teachers continue to be paid? 
the teachers have been paid. We have not stopped that. And I'd like to see, so we have two issues. Well, a couple of issues. Some teachers have used their own initiative and have taught their hearts out online using very frustrating means, WhatsApp or sending, recording themselves doing a, a, a lesson and sending it to their students, creating tests and sending it by WhatsApp and each student sends back their answer and they're marking it. And of course, you know, where the truth is you where you have a large enough collection of persons, you'll have all types. So while we have some teachers in the public system who are doing remarkably well all across sectors, nursery, primary, secondary, you have some very lazy teachers too who didn't um, even with the provision of services by some schools, you know, we gave you internet, we gave, not, not the ministry, the school itself, they didn't want to teach. So we have to be, and I don't blame the teachers or the schools. I think the ministry has to have a structured approach to this. So we don't leave it up to the teachers. We don't leave it up to the schools. We say, this is what we want. And we're training you to do it. Jamaica just trained 20,000 teachers to deliver education online. Uh, right. And, and um, ladies and gentlemen, it is important that we recall that not just uh, the, the lessons in school and not just the matter of getting to school, but the, the decision to make with regards to reopening the school has to do with the children's, uh, not just their physical safety, but their well-being, well-being, the holistic well-being of children is very important. And Minister would have mentioned that the school's physical state in terms of, of, of toilets and, and ventilation and all of that are things that needs to be taken in consideration. Minister, um, I just want to go to curriculum. And, and of course, we are talking about getting children and, and getting our schools up and running in terms of virtual schools and virtual lessons. Now, a lot of persons and a lot of our people are concerned that the internet connectivity is not there. We don't have enough internet penetration across the country to enable um, a lot of children to have access to those teachers who might be desirous of having such lessons, Minister. Is there any discussion happening on, on um, speeding up internet access um, in, in, in some of the communities that might need this? Oh, so, Yog, um, sorry about that little distraction. Okay. There is a breakaway, a diamond, a sluice has uh, broken away. And I think homes are underwater, so they're trying to use the school. I think it may be as an emergency measure um, to probably rescue residents. Um, so what we have is connectivity is the big issue. We could begin a program tomorrow if we could get two things, connectivity, not only, you see, it's, it's such a white thing. You got to get the teachers home connected and the students say one classroom, 25 different homes connected in many of the homes, you, you might have connectivity, but you don't have a device. So it's, um, at this stage, the best thing we met with NDMA, we're talking to gt &T, we're talking to G Digicel, but bandwidth and so on is because you want to teach by video. So for example, that, that putting uh, connectivity in schools, it's 10 MGs and that's uploading one video. So if I send 20 teachers to teach their classes, which one of them will use the, the Zoom feature that gives you a video of, uh, um, on our video option. So that is what is beating us right now. Um, and connectivity. Also device, plus also, I guess, the device of the children end as well, right? If devices of children. I mean, teachers, teachers, many of them have smartphones. And uh, we used to have a program. See, some of these things are, I'm, I, I get angry when I talk about them because we used to have a program where um, when we when we had designed the uh, improving teacher training, <coughs> we moved it from just a certificate to a degree. And on that program, every teacher who was being trained was given a computer. And when the program stopped, we started saying, well, pay $40,000 for your computer, which is very, very subsidized. We throw that into a revolving fund and you get your computer. So we start buying like that in years to go. Uh, APNU came into office. They said, oh, the OLPF, one laptop per family was stupidness. We'll give one laptop per teacher. They gave it for one year, Logan, and then stopped. 
completely stopped giving it. So what we have now is several years of teachers coming out of the college and going into the college who don't have laptops. When we designed the OLPF, and I know I would concede that the quality of the computers in that first batch were bad, but it would have, it would have, you could have improved that. Um, it was to make sure just this, homes have a device. Right now we have even more, I mean, where, where you have a smartphone, you have three children in the house. So which one are we gonna give priority to? And you, it's been a painful thing. Parents have had to choose. Well, you were in the exam cast and I heard some couple of backward things that are creeping back in. Well, you're the boy and you got earned. So you get to use the phone and our girl doesn't get to use the phone. That can't be how we go forward um, in this, this uh, kind of environment. So we have to plan not only for COVID-19, but we have to plan to absorb shocks. I mean, I think with the connectivity of the world and the easy travel and so on, these kinds of things will probably happen more and more. Um, and we have to create an environment where we could withstand these shocks better. So that's kind of what we're doing. Look, we just, I just ran in the house just before I came on here because I'm just coming from um, defending the budget at the Ministry of Finance. And that is the whole budget for these next four months is to try to get us ready, try to get us connected, try to get the curriculum in, a, in um, the kind of way that will, will be presented either online or uh, on TV or on the radio. Because, you know, it's one thing you could have a fantastic teacher in the classroom, but she just can't present on TV that would be attractive. Of course, yes. I was thinking we might actually need some actresses. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, one of the other problems I think we can all agree that we are aware of is, is um, you know, as you mentioned, in a home where there are more than one ch child that is at a different grade, then as you rightly pointed, there is a problem there, a unique problem that is. But Minister, the one thing that I know this can do, COVID provides us with an opportunity of, of recasting, replanning education at a very, very different paradigm. And yeah. hopefully with the national budget in, in your face there, it gives you an opportunity to now plan a next year education very, very different from what Guyana has known in the past. Right. So let me be very frank. Um, I, I would like to see COVID as that, that same kind of opportunity to rethink what we have been doing and to bring us up to scratch with the technology available in the world. The reality is we might not always have the capacity in terms of both personnel as well as skill set to uh, do what is needed because look, I'm telling you right now, I'm having the world's hellish trouble to even write lessons that would go on to TV and then to have people to produce it in a way that is attractive to children. Um, mm -hmm. So we see Cannes Academy or those kinds of programs. Right. When I put a really good teacher who's excellent in the classroom, but we just put them to teach, to talk to the screen, kids don't want to see it. So how do we create that? Do we have the skills down here to do that? Um, or do we need to train in a very uh, urgent and massive way? How do we create a curriculum that is not what we've been doing for the last 40 years, but pu that pulls out the important skills we need in this level um, in mathematics and English? Do we even need to do social si studies and science in this time? But how we pull that out and teach it in a manner so a teacher who has been teaching for the last 15 years, over 20 years, and they've been teaching um, one plus one equals two, and I want to move now to a shortened version of that, um, they might not know how to deliver it. We actually have to train them to do it. And, and so, like I was saying earlier, Jamaica has trained 20,000 teachers. Guyana has trained 90, nine zero, which is a drop in the bucket. So we have to go on mass, some mass training of our teachers, uh, make sure they have the skills they need online. But like you said, how do, you, how do we now grab this opportunity to make sure every teacher coming out of CPCE hereafter can deliver education online, can access training to do that, so that if this ever hits us again, we're not going to be in this position. So we, we just, we spoke to CPC last week. I met with them and I said, you now have to build into your curriculum a mandatory program, that a course that must be passed right. about delivering online education, delivering television education, that kind of thing. Great. 
And um, to that point, though, Minister, uh, I, I guess we all have to be concerned about the the interaction now, because one of the more important things of a child's life is is live interaction, which now seems to be taking a serious blow. Yeah. So we haven't measured, and we generally yeah, and I don't measure things like that, but um, there have actually been studies done on purely academically learning loss. And they have determined that for every three months you stay home, it's for every six months you stay home, it's about three months of quality education. So if you stay home a school year, you're talking about six months um, of quality learning. But when you measure that against going out and possibly dying or helping to kill your grandparents or parents, how do you really measure it? So, but, but the study has to be done about how you patch that up. And then the softer studies are what we call softer is that emotional psychological effect on children who thrive on mixing with each other and talking their own in their own lingo and age appropriate stuff at, 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 with friends. How do you replace that with um, staying home and looking at four walls and and you know parents alone? So it's it has a toll. And there have been some studies. The World Bank has put out some good um some good studies on what we should do possibly to minimize that right and it's all but it's all related to being what we should do to minimize that is you should have them connect online but again connectivity yes, yes. Not, and it is not the physical thing right yeah. um what has the, i know it's a, asking you a lot and very early has any thought been uh, thrown at you or been developed in terms of the, the private schools? Because while the public school teachers are being paid, I don't know that the same holds true for a lot of the private schools. And the private schools have a lot of loans and, and stuff that they got to, they, some of them might actually face closure. So, um, you know, just yesterday we were talking about one particular school that hadn't well, a couple of private schools have not paid their teachers. So a lot of people talk about how private school teachers are the prince and princesses amongst teachers, but that's not really always the reality. Public school teachers are protected from shocks in many, many ways that private school teachers are not. So whereas public school teachers have collected their salaries even in straight from March to now, private school teachers have not been paid, many of them from March to now. While we can't just send home public school teachers, the private school teachers don't have that kind of protection. So many of them have been sent home. Um, and we were talking about a particular school about whether they, they'd even be able to survive this because where, where schools are renting for millions of dollars a month and so on, if you're unable to collect fees, you're not gonna be able to pay those, those kinds of rents or mortgages, right? So um, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how something like this has such a domino effect across sectors um and then you have of course yeah the pri some private schools have taught as though school never stopped and that's incredibly commendable and then some public school students have never seen or interacted with a teacher from march to now and then they'll all be asked to write the same exam so those are some of the in inequalities you see right Minister, I want to take you to the fact that um, the secondary school exams um, would have been sat by a number of students, secondary school entrance, um, and whereas quite a number of students um, had the, uh, people had the option to opt out. Um, has any thoughts been given as to the placement when school eventually reopens for, for children who would have, especially those who would have opted, opted out? Well, we had said, we had said, uh, and I say we very loosely, I wasn't in the ministry at the time, but yeah. the ministry had said that uh, you could opt out. And I believe they had reported there after that 70 something children had opted out. Um, and if you opt out, you'll be placed in a school close to your home, um, no, but not in one of the senior secondary schools. So if you lived in Kingston, you wouldn't get QC. You know, you get another school close to your home. Um, that those results come out on the on the 25th latest of September. 
So even if we were to open, they won't be placed until you know sometime oh. in November or something. Not placed. They won't be um, going to school until a couple of weeks after. But assuming we open at all. But um, so yeah, placement shouldn't be too hard. I thought I thought the ministry could have been a little bit more creative in um, and innovative. This is our exam. It's it's a local exam. We don't have we could craft it however we want to craft it. Mm -hmm. It could have been written much later. It could have been written in January coming. It could have uh, we could have found other ways to place those students. You know, it was I think it was a bit traumatic because you see when you see third seventy something children don't go. I don't think people understand the trauma behind poor parents who want an education for their children and don't feel they have the option of keeping them away so you kind of send them and pray over them and hope they don't die kind of. mm -hmm. and the converse is also true that some of the the, the bright ones um for safety concerns would not have taken the exam and they might have deserved a good placement right right so that was a very individual call and i suspect while education in guyana is compulsory primary through secondary nursery is not and you actually could get into trouble for not sending your children to school even when we reopen whenever that is i think we'd have to go easy on parents who want to keep their children home for safety concerns right let's let's talk a little bit about uh, university level and it's it's budget time and one of the ppp's campaign slogans have been free free education and uh, Prem Hansraj, one of our viewers, has sent in the question to ask the Honorable Minister her comments on free education because university fees are now due. Right. So we said that within the first five years, you must remember that, uh, university education would be free. And, and we were very clear that it's not that it needs to be free, uh, that we have had it free before. And um, with the money coming into the country, we could have it free again. But we were not reckless. We didn't say the week after we get into office, the university education is going to be free. We said within the first five years, university education is going to be free. And we hold true to that promise. Mm -hmm. York, we're in a bad financial place right now. Bad, bad, bad. I'm not sure if you've been talking to other ministers, but it's in a very bad state financially. So, and parents are broke and um, the country money isn't circulating and people have businesses that are closing and the banks are looking at some trouble in, in, her, in terms of how their loans are being serviced and so on. I think but, Minister... In, in fact, I, I have created an email and a WhatsApp and everything to the finance minister except I don't have a name to send to. So I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting for that. But, um, you know, on Monday, Mr. Nanlal also had mentioned that, you know, as you were saying, that, you know, financially, we are in a very, very bad place. Very bad. So much sectors need help simultaneously right. that it is so difficult to make a call. Minister, um, the, uh, one of the viewers, this would have been, let me just acknowledge the person, I believe, Prem Hansraj or somebody would have asked this question of you. Um, I know, again, you have a lot on your plate, but trained teachers who continue to receive short salary, I don't know if that was brought to your attention, because they were placed on a wrong scale in 2016, 2017, that there are 100 plus teachers that are affected under the previous administration. The matter was forwarded to the Ministry of Education that was never resolved, and the HR at the Ministry of Education ought to be fully well aware of it. I do not know of that. So I want to thank your viewer to, for bringing that to my attention. And I suspect, not I suspect, it's something I intend to do. Put uh, something in place so that people can reach me direct, or reach my office directly with issues like this. Sometimes those get covered down before they reach me and they never reach me. Um, it can't be, it, it could would never be our intention to treat, especially teachers who, you know, our teachers need to be as happy as we can make them. Um, and that, that doesn't always mean uh, the hugest salary, but it means a good working condition and satisfaction and so on on the job. But if we have people on the wrong scale, then of course, it's something we have to look at. Right. And, and we're prepared to look at very early. So I just made a note. Right. 
would you have already started looking at the Teaching Services Commission and what happens there and who you appoint and so forth? Uh, that's a constitutional body. Um, okay. So it has it has a specific a specific composition, and it's uh, we're told how to make that happen. It's not in the discretion of the minister or or any minister. Um, right. But no, I haven't looked at those kinds of things. I haven't looked at school boards. I haven't looked at um, other boards. We've just been doing two things, almost single-mindedly. But in doing those, you got so much of an overview. Um, preparing for the budget, which we presented today, so we have a little bit of a breather now. And um, trying to figure out what to do to get to schools uh, reopening, whether face-to-face -face or virtually. And so we're in a good place with those two issues right now. So right. we, we have a chance to look at some other things. Right. Minister, I was on radio. Um, it was during those infamous five months, and I was on radio every day. And I was really appealing to the then, to your predecessor, because while they were busy making plans and going ahead with whatever, I guess, was, was, was their thoughts with getting those exams done, little, if any, thought was being given to the students, the special needs children. Um, children who just can't stand wearing a mask because of health issues. Right. And I think in a lot of ways, those children have now been tremendously disadvantaged. I will not ask you, but I, I just an appeal that I hope that whatever decisions your ministry takes with regard to placement of students in the future as we reopen, that special needs student must be catered for in every single school right. and so it breaks my heart. We have so far been unable to serve properly children with special education needs. Um, and that going forward is not acceptable. So there had been a couple of things we had done, including um, pulled out and drafted a policy on how to go forward, a policy on how to have teachers move up in the special needs area. So, you know, a teacher who's teaching special needs children should be able to have a clear path, upward, upward mobility path. And some of those things that make a huge difference, even now in planning to teach on TV, we'll have to plan differently for special needs students. And that hasn't even begun um, because, you know, obviously because it's a smaller population, generally, I guess, governments cater for larger populations first, but it's on the table for me. Um, and just meeting with, we, we already, uh, I, I have, um, uh, as a note made uh, attempts to um, buttress our resources by partnering with other countries for special needs education. It's hugely important. It's hugely important. I think, I think, you know, we could judge ourselves based on how well we deal with those very small vulnerable groups. We could have some fancy grades in, in the general population and then if we ignore the people who really, really need us and would not be able to progress without us, then I think we're cutting our, our, our real impact in half. Right. Correct. Minister, um, the, uh, my apologies. One of the reasons why the, the, uh, the, the TSC was mentioned, um, just FYI, sent in by a viewer, that the TSC advertised senior vacancies months ago but to date, no promotion was done. And as a result, senior teachers who applied for transfers cannot get the transfers because promotion and transfers are not done by, or have not been done by the TSC. So just, just I know that it, it's not, has not been one of the things you've been focused on opening. Well, the TSC needs to be, I saw, I saw something that said one of my advisors had been, um, had resigned. Well, some Mr. Shera, she's governance, told me that uh, she just wanted me to know one of my advisors had resigned. So I said, my advisor, she said, yes, uh, certain she named the person. And we don't, nobody in the ministry knows who it is. So we don't know where this person was located or sitting or anything. Turns out the person was over at TSC. You, you can't have that kind of, um, you know, your, your TSC person can't be the minister's advisor. So some of those um, um, you know, they get a little bit too, not a little bit too intertwined. They should not be that kind of intertwining. Tell us a little bit about your experience with the political appointees. Has there been any that you had to kind of frown on and clear the way? Political appointees. Um, I consider political appointees people who did not have to apply to get into the system. Mm -hmm. So I also think 
ministers will appoint persons who they're comfortable with. I say that very loosely because I'm speaking very generally. For me, I'm comfortable with anybody who wants to work with me and who is prepared to both one work, use their own initiative, but also uh, adjust a little bit for how I am and the pace I go at. Because, you know, my predecessor, we might have totally different speeds, rates at which we work um, and hours and so on. And if you're willing to work with me, I'm willing to work with you and we can learn each other together and, and you know, make this office fly. Um, so I am not, I am not shifting persons from my office if they're going to continue to work. What I did find was a very large secretariat. And unfortunately, I can't in good conscience keep such a large secretariat because a personal secretariat because, you know, things are hard in the country. It's, it's a bit of wastage. It's a lot of wastage. And so, yes, I have had to um, move, not fire, but send back to relevant departments, some of the persons who were in my office, and ask and help to find alternative employment for a few. Yes. God bless you, you did, because you, I don't want you to make a, I know you wouldn't, but I don't want any advisor to advise you Easter, Christmas, Pagwa Diwali, <laughs> so, <laughs> Minister, uh, um, jokes aside, Rocky Kumar is, is asking whether your government has any thoughts about Region 3 in terms of replicating what you would have successfully, your government would have in the past successfully done in Burbese for a university campus. Um, Region 3, I have not heard any extensive. Look, we would have a dream to have a university, even if not the University of Guyana um for every region and bring that kind of local economy uh local money to the local economy and so on that and everything that happens when you have a university we have discussed a couple of things you know, i'm talking about this for the first time um, and one of them is is getting offshore universities here or partnering with with universities even ivy league ones to carry out um learning and teaching here, not only to Guyanese, but to people around the world who want to come and enjoy our tropics while they learn and our, our economy and our green economy and Iwakrama and all these other things we have to offer. So we don't, we haven't specifically spoken about UG and I think that's what your, your Rocky was asking, um, but we have spoken about, about uh, bringing down other universities, including the University of um, universities across the Caribbean. You know, we have done very well with having Texilla is here and Texilla produces mass numbers of students um, every year and that kind of thing. And, and when the, you go around the Texilla school and you speak to homeowners and so there, you'll see how they help to boost the local economy there. And Minister, as you mentioned that, let, uh, in your past, in uh, your previous uh, occupying the same office, you, would you have spent a lot of time looking at uh, um, uh, accreditation of these uh, other universities other than University of Guyana? Um, we have the National Accreditation Council. Have I spent a lot of time? So let's just be, um, no. When I was at the Ministry of Education, we spent only um, two and some years. The rest of it was an election. Uh, you remember how that happened. The National Accreditation Council was for me an urgent matter that had to be dealt with um, because it was doing such important work. And I felt like there was a lot of scope for subjectivity and discretion because it wasn't professionalized. It didn't even have a structure. You know. It had sort of a person who wasn't qualified to, to do that just there. That's what I'd met. Um, and there were a lot of complaints about how this was being run and how people were being pushed around and so on. So when you look at what we have put in place as a structure, the person had to have a degree in certain um, qualifications and then there was a structure coming down. Still, there is a National Accreditation Council. Um, I don't think that would have gone as far as we envisioned it since we did it because I know they have basic transportation problems now. You can't have transportation problems if you have to credit schools. Um, and we wanted some regulations and so on passed on the door. So I know there was a stall up, but it can't be something we treat lightly with. It is something that is going to become more important as we develop and as we become more attractive 
because uh, while we want to attract other universities, other schools, other, um, other institutions that need to be accredited, we want to make sure we have standards that can be internationally um, accepted and so that people who come here get treated well in terms of and have an expectation in terms of how marketable they are after they're finished. So it's, it is something that has taken on new and more urgent importance than say five years ago. Mm -hmm. Of course. Minister, are you, are you beating your fist on the table in your cabinet meetings demanding that you need a quick resolution to the internet problems in this country so you could deliver a brand new education system to this country? I'm way too calm to be beating my fist <laughs> on the table. Um, yeah, that's not a cabinet, wholly a cabinet prob problem, though. Um, the connectivity issue is one that is major not only for me. It's major for health. It's major for um, dissemination of information. It's, it's hugely important, and it's something that we must resolve. I, I think we have made a couple of promises about those. And we're going to be looked at. Yes, probably. because I can tell you, I'm aware of quite a number of investors that are really, really looking at Guyana with a keen eye to help us get a robust, um, you know, upgraded internet system that can be going to every home. Minister, um, one of the reasons I raised the matter of, of um, the accreditation with the universities, uh, just, just for you to probably uh, pay note to, uh, I know it would have been engaging your attention uh, when you were the former minister, now you have returned. Curriculum. Curriculum for, for the schools, um, uh, I, I think in a lot of ways people are saying that it needs upgrading, but particularly minister, particularly, there are some subject areas that have been skewed over the past two, three, four, five decades again, history in particular. I have myself gone to law school in Guyana, as you know. I have not seen that the history we read there reflects well of the Amerindians, reflects well of all the cultures of Guyana. Mm -hmm. Is there some thought for a medium to long-term solution for a review of some of these things across? Not even medium, not even medium. Very short term, we're looking for results. When I left in um, 2015, we had begun curriculum review. Well, if you looked at like the 2013 budget and so on, you'll see us talking about it. Unfortunately, it didn't move at a pace. By now, we should have had new curriculums across the system. Everything limped along. So what we have right now is grades one and two that's been written and tested. And we're going to implement those almost immediately. Um, they've been tested for two years. You know, you have a standard about when you can implement, you have to test it, you have to see how it goes and so on. Those two are ready, but even as we are writing the others, we are, because we've engaged a Canadian firm to do that for us, we're going to implement the ones we have finished. The curriculum now is outdated. It's outdated. It is heavy with stuff you don't need. When we were learning all the 54 uh, Commonwealth countries and their heads of state and what they eat and where they, what their capital is and who is their, what's their currency and what they export and what they import, we didn't have Google. We didn't have the ability, people didn't have even, I have a series of Encyclopedia Botanica upstairs. I'm not gonna do away with them because when I gotten them much younger, it was a big thing to have those, a shelf full of those in the house you know um but now you don't need to learn these things and force them into your head as a matter of recall we have to be teaching our children a little bit more i think to reason to how to look for information so that's a whole different that's like a whole subject um our curriculum didn't keep up with the things we have learned as a country so we have passed laws that say boys and girls are equal, men and women are equal as far as their um, their abilities go and what they can do and what opportunities they should have. But we teach our children from grade one that daddy is the homemaker and mommy is the caregiver. And we test them on it. What is mommy good at? And your kid is forced to sit there and write, cook and clean the house. And you have children um, from 29% of this country who see their mother cook and clean the house and go to work, their single parents, and bring home money and look after them and, and so on. So you, you have to teach relevant content. Um, 
and and half of the team well 90 percent of the teachers in the school are women so what are you saying to children and it's very contradictory so if we're looking at only that one issue secondly they go way too deep so if you look at what grade six and grade five students do for the eye and the ear and the circulatory system they do work that um some first year degree students do so how relevant is that while our time is taken doing that we're, we're woefully lacking in in literacy and numeracy skills so what is it we need more to be able to read understand and reason and do mathematics properly the majority of our students are cram information into them um, so that's what we're looking at, and that will happen um, because I feel so strongly about it. Um, it will be speeded up. Like I said, I haven't spoken to the firm that's doing this as yet because we were you know, really taxed doing a couple of other things, but that's high on my agenda so that we all meet and we understand where we want to go with this. Right. Minister. Um, Even it, testing. Yeah, sorry. Go on, go on. Even testing, we test our kids at 10 years old and we make them feel so inadequate because, you know, your, the child who gets Brigdam secondary feels like a total failure. Brigdam secondary, when you look at it, is really 93 and 94% you got in that test. The reality is QC could not hold more than 120 students. So you were QC material, you just couldn't fit. So how do we make sure and this is, this is a, a, a searching question that I have to answer in this first term. How do we make sure, one, our children are not pressured in that way at 10 years old and 11 years old so that they have this huge life decision to make? But the only way to do that is to make sure all, all our secondary schools have been brought up to a standard where it doesn't matter which one you go to, you'll have a fantastic quality education. That's right. I mean, all schools should be the QC level of schools, right? Exactly. And you know, here's the thing. We have 114 high schools. We can make all schools the QC level. Teachers have to be on board. The government has to have the will. And we just, so we have to spend money to do that. And we have to make sure teachers go in there, are qualified and teach. And you will have the results because it's physically, physical infrastructure is fixed and train teachers going and teach, we can make this happen easily too. That's right. Minister, here is a, a suggestion. Under the COVID, under this COVID period, and, and of course, as you reshape the future for education in the country, Guyana has a plethora of, of television stations. And we could, we could uh, say, okay, television stations, we're going to waive one third or one fifth of your spectrum fees, for example, to give to the Ministry of Education four hours a day. And if 13 television stations run each grade for a different television station, runs an education program that is structured by you and your people there, we can achieve something, and that goes right across the country. We're looking at it, so that's one of the things we're looking at, and it's not necessarily even waive your fees. At this stage, for the short term, it's pay you to host this for us. But where do you reach? So we're presently examining from our learning channel. So where are you on right now? This is Facebook. So um, let's take, and CN has very far reach. The learning channel is supposed to have very far reach. We've stopped broadcasting in some places we were broadcasting in just because of uh, stuff is broken. Um, but let's take NTN. NTN may only be reaching the coast. So if I teach on NTN, mathematics from nine to 10 for grade one, right. then how are my children at Linden getting that? Mm -hmm. So Got we it. have to find the various places that are reaching places. And we're doing that study right now to determine where. In the meanwhile, while we create the content. Great. And, and I certainly hope, I mean, you know my views uh, that has been aired a lot about NCN and Chronicle. But I think there you have two wonderful assets that should be totally dedicated to education instead of politics. But that's Yog Mahadeo's well, view. Well, we, we have a whole learning channel that, that, that was dedicated to education. We had promised and we had kept that promise that no politics would happen on the channel. Yeah. And, um, but, but the APN, you changed that, incidentally. They had Correct. political shoes on the channel. Correct. Um, Minister, I want to get back to some customs and practice. Uh, there has been, as you know, uh, the former PPP government 
of which you have been part of, would have been accused of a number of things, including favoring suppliers and favoring persons and stuff like that. Is your current government um, promising to be more open with looking at people who you do business with? And one of the things I know that struck a wrong, well, a bad chord in the past was the printing of textbooks. Your comments. There wasn't a printing of textbooks that struck a bad chord. Did we have a problem with that? Um, I don't remember that. Listen, we have promised a more transparent, open government that addresses um, systemic corruption. I spoke, it's funny you raised that. I had a long meeting today with my buildings person. We have a whole engineering department in the Ministry of Education and my procurement head. Some contractors came to me last week. I never meet a contractor by myself ever. So they know there will never ever be a photograph or a recording or anything with a contractor meeting me alone because it will never happen. Um, so I met them with the permanent secretary and they had a plethora of complaints that I re repeated to my um, engineering department and my procurement head. They were being discriminated against. They felt that ethnically they were not being treated um, equally. They felt that um, the, the decisions about whether to give them contracts and so on were subjective and in the discretion of whoever was distributing those. The way to change that is to make sure systems are in place, in my view, and published so that it's not in the discretion of anybody. It's not whether my buildings person likes you or wants a bribe from you. It is not whether my, um, my procurement person likes the way you look or the way you vote. It's not whether Priya wants a bribe. It is, this is the process. This is what has been published and um, how that everybody knows that process and can visibly witness it. And we came up with a couple of means. So the things that go to the tender board, which is anything over $3 million in the ministry, um, that's very open. That's by law, it goes to the tender board and ad is put out, people bid, you go to the tender board, they're all open, the uh, lowest qualified bidder, responsive bidder gets that bid. So that's very public. Where you have a problem, I thought, was where they're um, either emergency works or pre-qualified works. So people pre-qualify and they're, the tender board pre-qualifies them. And when works come up under $3 million, our buildings department probably working with, um, with our procurement department decide who's going to get it. I believe, and I have to believe that, that those decisions are made based on all kinds of information, who has the capacity, um, who will deliver, who they've worked with before, whatever. But we can't leave it up to chance. So we have come up with a very um, measured way of how everybody will be involved in who gets chosen, including the persons who are on this list. And we'll announce that shortly. And that's going to be on a website so everybody could find it and you could come and say, well, you said you would do this, but this you departed from this process. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is try to make sure I, um, we have a facility and a mechanism too for people to get me. So not me, Priya, but they, they could complain and it doesn't have to pass through the people you are complaining about mm -hmm. uh, so that we could look at those complaints. Now, those have been some of the complaints. I haven't heard the textbook complaint. I heard the exercise book complaint. Um, so, and that's one that I, I, I never understood why the previous minister didn't, didn't change that. We're buying exercise books. We're procuring them, so sourcing the books from Ghana National Printers. Ghana National Printers is buying those books from Trinidad, um, from whoever they choose in Trinidad. And we have local people here supplying. And that makes no sense to me, like none. And supplying at a cheaper rate. Now, we are not in the business of propping up any government agency or any agency at all. We have to give, every time we take a $3 from an exercise book, we rob the children when you add up those $3 of another book they can get. We have to serve in the best interest of children, not in the best interest of friends and, and family. I haven't heard of any, like I said, the, the, sometimes it's not whether there's corruption, but whether people feel like the system was corrupt. Right. And but we have to remove 
important. Perception, exactly. So we have to remove, um, and people feel that way when they don't know what is happening, when they don't see it before their very eyes. Someone said to me in one of the meetings, well, you know, we never get no work. You got to give me some contracts. It doesn't work like that. I can't pick up my contracts in a file and hand it to you or put some money in a salt bag and give it to you. It doesn't work like that. What we could do, though, is teach you how to bid because sometimes you might have great skills as a furniture maker. We need furniture for schools, but you don't know how to fill up this form in a way that would help you win this bid. Um, and we're not teaching you separately. We're teaching everybody how to fill up this form, what is required. You know, if you're going to bid for furniture, you need these kinds of equipment that would make you qualify, that kind of thing. So we could do it in a mass way. That, and, and we spoke today, too, about finding a way that is legal to make sure, because if you have a big contractor that comes into the ministry and bid for the small works, they'll probably win. And just share volume would allow them to have profit. With us, we need to have, um, I, I'd like to see some system device, probably not for education alone, but across the sectors, how do we ensure persons who want to be entrepreneurs? So a contra uh, civil engineer comes out of UG, they work for a couple of years in a government agency and wants to do more and look after their families better and expand their, you know, their business. How do we help them by giving them a break in the system, not corruptly, but in a structured way, helping small contractors. How do we make sure the very few female contractors get a share of the work that allows them to expand a little bit more? Because it's not a sector women are known to be in. And women ha might have specific um, considerations. So you don't want to be unfair. But how do we help those smaller groups in this contractual sector. So it might be something for education alone to look at, but procurement generally. Great. Minister, from um, one of our viewers, Rosita Fassad, that um, do you plan to have any broad-based engagement with teachers who might themselves have great ideas about how to yes. work through them? Yes, so last week, Thursday, I'm very disappointed. I told someone today. Last week, Thursday, at about 5.30, I had to be in isolation because, well, myself quarantine because we had all done that test and we didn't know who was positive and who wasn't and by 5 30 i was climbing a wall so i sent a message to say i'd really like some um town hall type virtual meetings both pta as well as with teachers we've i've been so busy i don't have the capacity to do that myself so i needed help from the um computer people and by, up to today, they haven't responded. So I was a little dis disappointed. They told me it can happen and it will happen. But we can't just get up one night at 7 o'clock and say, teachers, I'm going to hear you. We have to advertise it. We have to give them the password, the ID. So it has to be something we do. So I'm looking to have a PTA-type forum this weekend. We'll, we'll advertise it. And I want a forum specifically with teachers. We'll advertise that too. I'd like a forum with grade six teachers and parents, perhaps separately or together, because the grade six students, the students are going to go into grade six in September. They haven't finished their grade five curriculum, but they're going to be asked March, April next year to write a grade six exam. So what do we do with those, those students? How do you feel about these options we have, that we push the exam back, that we do only paper one, that we drop social studies and science, that we, you know, some, some very many options. I really like Yog to hear from almost everybody because um, it's, it's strange how you don't get some perspectives when you listen to only professionals at the ministry. Um, right. You don't get the class. At that point, Minister Angel is asking, well, how do we contact you if there are particular issues we need to bring to your attention? Will you be setting up a, a ministry's email or, or some protocol that people can follow? Hmm. So that's an interesting question. I had a public day for teachers, especially every um, when I was there um, once a month and it was advertised and I had a public day for the public. But in this COVID circumstance, and even without, whoever asked that, please say thank you, because we're going to do two things. I suspect I'm thinking of a hotline um, or, uh, like you said, an email address or a particular Facebook page. Let me examine with, with some tech-savvy people what might be a good way to reach, reach us. Correct. 
And one of our viewers from Esequibo Coast has asked if some attention could be given to the Anna Regina schools and schools across Esequibo, but I know that in your overall view for the country. All right, so Esequibo, we are very disappointed. The Learning Channel, I've only been um, informed in this week that is not working in Esequibo. I, I don't understand how we can have a Learning Channel in the whole course is not getting it. So we're working very hard to change that. Um, Esequibo has produced proportionately, so well, compared to what the, the number of people and students they have and trained teachers and so on have done very, very well. And it's for me, um, one, of the, one of the places we can address holistically because it has a beginning and an end in terms of the coastline. Um, so they're going to see a lot, the Esequibo residents, you're going to see a lot more of us in Esequibo. Great. Minister, I want to come back a little bit to placement of children, and you, you raise an interesting point with regards to some of those exams that are locally driven. Given that the likelihood of school being pushed back further into this year, if at all, might the ministry consider having another sit of the same exam by the end of the year? Of the same exam of the last NGSA of, exam. Of, new, of a new exam, but of the same for the same purpose. For the 2020 year. Mm -hmm. Um for the 74 students yes. who did not take it. Who did not take it. But is that fair? Because when we said to the other 15,000 students that you have to go and write it, we didn't say but we'll have a second go in December if you don't want to write it now. So I, I don't close the door to anything. I, I'd like to see how these results look as against other years, um, but we, we have to also do what's fair. We set these exams and that's why for me, it was disappointing that we went ahead and wrote them um, at that time in that manner. Um, like I said, we can't be doing things just to check a box. Well, why are we doing this? We're doing it so this child's best interest could be served. Okay. I don't know that sending children out in those very nerve-wracking condition, wrecking conditions with parents who are worried, with children who hadn't engaged teachers for a long time could be in their best interest. And that's why I say I am not taking anything off the table for this new batch because this new batch is supposed to write in March, April next year, but they haven't seen teachers from, I'm not talking about the private schools, private schools are fine. But the public school children, most of them have not seen or engaged with a teacher from March to now. So you're not even finished your grade five curriculum. I'm going to, if I put the same kind of exam paper in front of you next year, you'll be looking at it like a foreign language. So we have to be able to, this is a pandemic. We must be able to think outside the box and do things a little differently to make sure we are serving our children. Um, and, and with regards to out-of-the-box thinking, of course, um, homeschooling, um, uh, it has its grave disadvantage, of course, in if you want your children to, to be, you know, cohabiting and, 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 and stuff like that. But um, is it something that the ministry will now start to think about, that there might be cases where parents will opt for homeschooling? And as we develop exams, um, the, the, the children who are homeschooled will now have the ability to sit in these exams and stuff like that. So I think we have an education act that is more than a century old, which makes every this education is, is compulsory, going to school is compulsory. But you would know that the PPP opened up education in 92, where we said you can, you can do private schools. And it's your choice whether you send your child to a private school or not. And so that was an intention and a signaling that we can open up how we do this. And this time, um, for me, we have to allow parents the freedom to, again, anything we do has to be with the child's interest at heart. So we can't allow you to keep your child home and abuse them when we should be having them in school. But if we are satisfied that you are homeschooling, surely it's something we can move to and to accommodate those children in writing exams and so on also. So yes, it is something that we can look at. We'd have to be able to monitor that though, Yob, and that's the problem because we don't want parents who will not send their children to school or children who might be truants and then tell us, well, I was homeschooling. So how do you make sure you monitor that to make sure what we intend to do, which is to serve this child, is actually happening? 
Of course. And, and I guess that is one of the things we'll have to develop, create a central registration system for children or parents to sign up that we decide to go homeschooling because right. it's an investment they're making for their direct, uh, both their well-being and everything. Right. Because also homeschooling serves a purpose of, of people who have religious considerations and special needs children as well. Yeah. Yeah, or just parents. I, I like I like the idea of homeschooling myself because um I, I don't know, what are you calling homeschooling? Because if, if it means that a parent has to do it, I don't like that idea. Because I <laughs> no. become a shrew, I was screaming and shouting all the time, go do this, go do this, sit down there, don't move. And you know, right. they every, right then when they sit down a pencil got a sharpen, somebody will fall down. Everything happens that that to get away from it. But if homeschooling could mean I hire a teacher and have them at home, why not? Correct. The reason I raise this, because a new paradigm is also opening, and that is uh, teachers who are now providing homeschooling services, which means they'll be probably paid at a premium, and parents who are happy to keep their children out of the risk yep. area and, and have that accommodation done. But it also means that, that you are right, Minister, because we have to be careful that the right curriculum is being followed and the child is at the same level or even higher than what might prevail in the public school um, circumstances. Not quite curriculum, but at a curriculum. Maybe if we're going to do that kind of thing, then we should have choices. This is the curriculum you're following, the American one or the Caribbean one or you know, the, the academic, the, the um, sport child one that adds in some academic, I guess there can be choices, but I think there'd have to be a little bit more stricter monitoring mm -hmm. of, of what those choices are. But yes, I think to, to answer you, is it a possibility? I think it is. I think it is something that would have to be properly thought through, but yes. Great. Well, Minister, thank you. That was very interesting. We know you are quite busy and you're working night and day. And my last question to you is that in a country like Guyana, where we allow the free enterprise to be and we allow the market to set its price in, in, a, uh, in the areas that are competitive, um, private school fees has been somewhat of a bone of contention for a number of parents in the past. With COVID, it also became quite a, a, a shock for a lot of parents because schools insisted on collecting the same, if not higher fees. Is there any thought in the minister's mind for uh, an, an attention, if nothing else, to be paid on uh, to, to house private schools are charging fees? Not presently, no. The Ministry of Education remains open to replacing children who have gone to the private schools and can't afford it and would like to come back into the public system. But I, I think we have to be careful with how we regulate and try to police prices on schools and services generally. Um, there, there are enough private schools to make it competitive. So. If you don't like private school A and their fees, then uh, but you really like private schools, then you can take your child to pri private school B. Um, or you could just say, I don't want to pay any fees, in which case you go to the public system. When that starts happening, private school A and private school B, like any other business, start competing for better prices and so on, but and better grades. So some people will pay through their noses for a certain type of uh, output at common entrance. Some people say, I don't care about the output because I'd like a more rounded education. So you have different things that parents are looking for. And I think that is, so no, I don't have any plan to regularize what, what uh, private schools charge. There have been complaints, but there, there are also choices. And I don't mean to sound harsh um, because I understand those complaints. I understand why we all want to pay um, fairly, but but uh, and, and not be overcharged for any service. But we also have choices. And so there is no intention right now to regulate how private schools charge. I think parents would have to exercise their choice if they don't like a particular fee to go somewhere else. And we are very happy to receive children in the public system. There's always that option. 
and we're always prepared to do that. Great. And to Carleen Petal Williams, um, she has raised an important point for those parents who are looking at homeschooling. In other countries like the USA, there are homeschooling associations. So uh, I guess it's time we start all as parents and um, start to think about how we can help the education ministry by creating associations, having our rules and having our regulations set up and you know, the, the, the paradigms within which we wish to operate, and then we can get the ministry's engagement. I'm sure minister would be open to having such discussions on, on taking this forward. Mm -hmm. Minister, it's been a pleasure. Any, any other thoughts and expressions you would like to share with us? Well, one thing that I haven't said yet publicly, but I think this program is as good enough a place to say it. Um, and again, I think parents and teachers really need to know it's a decision we took that the grades two, four, and nine assessments for the cohort for the year 2020 will be canceled, are canceled, um, and for the cohort of 2020. So we're not gonna try to have this year's children write it in 2021. The 2020 kids will not be writing grades two, four, and nine assessments at all. Um, we're able to, we're going to be able to assess them differently. Um, I will, we'll review that decision when we come to 2021, but for 2020, that's what it is. Great. Well, Minister, it's been a pleasure to have you here and we know you are busy we wish you success in your ministry. And on behalf of our viewers and listeners, let me extend room 592 um, for the purpose of disseminating information and time to you and your ministry. Yes, thank you. We, we're looking at how we can engage um, these kinds of, well, like the Kaitura radio and so on. So yes, we will be talking back. Take care. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you here and do have a great night and our regards to your family. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to have you all here. We are looking to reconnect with you on Friday night when we'll be having no other than Mr. Freddie Kisoon in room 592. Remember, we continue to assess what is happening politically. We continue to assess what is happening all across the country. And in room 592, we have taken a decision to address the sector ministers, to educate everyone what is happening on each sector. Monday, we had the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs. Today, we have had the Honorable Minister of Education, Minister Priyamani Chand. Next week, Monday, we'll be engaging with the Minister of Infrastructure and uh, Bishop Edgel. And so we are looking to engage with the ministers of the various portfolios to tell us what is happening in their sector, because their sector is everybody's business. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Room 592, where we unleash the truth. I want to remind you all, COVID is still on the rise in Guyana, and so we need to protect ourselves as well as we have to carry on with our work and our lives. Do protect yourself and protect your family. Let me say thanks to Kevin Smith and the entire technical team at Kaito Radio for making this program possible, working hard behind the scenes to put things together. And let me thank you all for joining us here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. It's been an interesting discussion with the Minister of Education as we spoke quite a lot about the, 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 the reopening of schools, of course, the curriculum of schools, the placement of children who would have written the exams and those who chose to opt out of the secondary schools entrance examinations and the plans, of course, for private schools and homeschooling. In addition, we discussed uh, special needs, children with special needs. We also discussed using the national television and the newspapers, the state agencies, to disseminate information and to give education to the students, as well as relooking really at some of the curriculum, especially history across from university all across the schools because a lot of people have opined that the Amerindians and East Indians and Africans and everybody, everybody's history needs to be well and equally represented across the curriculum, especially in history. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been great to have you here in room 592 tonight. Do be safe wherever you are. And remember to say a prayer for this beautiful country of ours. It is still the best place on God-given planet. Be safe. Bye-bye now. COVID-19 Tips, sponsored by Dexo.
One, practice social distancing. Two, wear your mask when leaving the house. Three, wash your hands regularly for 20 seconds using our deck soap. Four, cover your nose and mouth with a disposable tissue or flex elbow when you cough or sneeze. Choose deck soap for that extra cleanliness. Deck soap is affordable and available nationwide. Kiteur.